what I thought would be really interesting for us to talk about today, and since I know everybody on the call, we probably don't have to go do introductions because I think everybody's met everybody. <laughs> um, what I wanted to talk about today was, as Zach was presenting last week, it kind of came to mind that we could try a, a kind of a fun little adventure this this month. And the reason that th the reason that it kind of came to mind was we were talking about different development styles, and Zach did one on um, pride driven pride driven development, basically debugger driven development, and that. Every time I hear that like mindset, it, it reminds me that like I'm kind of in a bubble as far as a developer. Uh, I think about things a very particular way, and whenever I hear different viewpoints that are outside that, I think, man, I'm I'm in my own little echo chamber here sometimes. And so I thought it would be really kind of fun to to play around with the code that um, that was presented last month and um, see where we can take it. Just kind of explore that a little bit. Uh, you've probably, if you're a developer, done something with FizzBuzz before. It's kind of a, a pretty well-known kind of, usually it's like an interview kind of a question, like here, solve this problem on a whiteboard in front of me, which is kind of miserable. I hate it for that. Uh, but I do like it for the idea of kind of replaying the same kind of problem over and over again and, and looking at it from different perspectives. All of that kind of came through my mind, Zach, as you were presenting. And then one other thing came to mind at the end of it. Um, and that is, it's hard to do this and really understand where other people are coming from without essentially a set of well-defined, understood uh, specs or outcomes. Like, it's hard to be on the same page unless you know what you're trying to get out of something. And I think one of the things happened in the in the presentation with FizzBuzz that made me remember a part of FizzBuzz that I that I've forgotten, and that kind of makes me makes me want to talk through how to add tests to production code that's already there so that we can build that basis of understanding. So give me just one second. All right, so um, the concept of having code that runs in production without tests is kind of similar to when you see somebody else program something and you wonder, okay, how would I have done that differently now that you know that code is already there, it's it's in my mind already, right? When you're running production code, especially production code that somebody else wrote, um, you may not really understand what it's actually doing. You can read it, but you might not actually understand what it's doing. And certainly, if you understand it, that's pretty ephemeral if you don't do anything about that, right? So I looked at the code that Zach wrote. Um, Zach, do you prefer Zach or Zachary? It doesn't matter to me at all. OK. Um, when I looked at that code, and I kind of modified it a little bit because you were kind enough to put that into a gist um, after the end of, of last month. So I put it into uh, just a new gym project. And so we've got this code here. This is pretty similar to, it's a little bit modified, like I'm not reading from standard input, uh, but it's pretty similar to the code that you demonstrated last month. And there's some comments up here about some of the rules and that kind of a thing. And um, what I'd kind of like to go through this month is the process of imagining that I was handed this code and it was running in a production environment and I was being asked to make a change to it. Um, but if I'm asked to be, if I'm asked to make a change to code in production that I don't understand, there are two primary ways that I can approach that. And I learned these two primary ways the hard way, basically just from being a developer. But I've also got this really amazing book that I've read that is is really helpful for kind of walking through that. Um, and I'm going to go a little bit off script here and, and try to find that. Um, this book is called. Working Effectively with Legacy Code is by a guy named Michael Feathers. Uh, there's a couple of books on refactoring and, and patterns that you can use for basically taking code and changing it to be to do the same things, but in different ways. Um, but this is a really good book basically for writing, working effectively with code that you didn't write or that you wrote yesterday. Because <laughs> I think legacy code is a really funny misnomer. Legacy code to me is basically any code that's out there that that doesn't have tests that you understand. Um, and so if we kind of go through just the table of contents here, we can look at this and there is there's it kind of goes through like the reasons why you want to change software and what what kind of things make software risky or not risky. 
Um, I'm hoping that this is the part of the book that, oh, you can see I've, I've got this thing highlighted like crazy. Um, I'm not going to find it. Yeah, so anyway, we're, what we're dealing with though today is kind of the process of this legacy code dilemma, right? When you want to change code, in order for you to be confident, confident and comfortable with making that change, you should have tests in place. Um, that's kind of just a generally accepted thing, especially within the Ruby um, Ruby development sphere, is that tests are are really paramount or really important. Um, but the problem is the dilemma is that to put tests in place, you often have to change the production code, right? So there's like a there's like a chicken and egg problem. Um, when we're making change to software, we can either choose to try to read all of the software that we've seen and try to make changes by understanding everything and then getting in, making the change, and then getting back out. That's one way to do it. And that's called the um, pray, and, pray and modify, I think is what it's called. Um, the other option to that, though, is that we can cover that code with tests, and then you can be confident about the change. So you basically cover it and make the change, and then you know, you have you have a little bit more confidence, and you also have a test suite that you're building that that gives you what Michael calls um, islands of I think it's islands of tests or islands of confidence, something like that. Um, anyway, that was kind of all the that was that was all the impetus or the driver for what I was thinking. Is I was just watching Zach, you were you were demonstrating how your your debugger driven development process works, and um, I was just, I just noted it, how different that is from the way that I think and that I work. And I thought this diversity of thoughts is really important and interesting. And I'd love to be able to kind of loop that into um, uh, an opportunity for us to refactor the code together and kind of, kind of look at it together. Um, I'm hoping if I click back, oh, here we go. So what we need to do first in order to be able to have that shared basis for being able to refactor and make changes is we need some kind of test coverage. And I thought it would be kind of fun to pretend like we don't know how FizzBuzz is actually supposed to work. Um, that's kind of the big twist on today. So rather than looking at a spec for FizzBuzz or even looking at the comments, because as we all know, if we look at comments, they're only as good as the person who wrote them's last thought about how the software is supposed to work, not how it actually works. And I've been I've been the, the villain many times in writing comments that were completely untrue because they became untrue after I changed the code. Um, so I want to talk about characterization tests. And what this is, is it's a process for taking code that you think you might understand or that you don't understand and characterizing its behavior by adding tests to it after the fact. And um, this just seemed like a really good example for how we could use characterization tests because I didn't write that code, Zach, that you wrote. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of excited about just sort of exploring what characterization tests would look like for it. So uh, there's a process. Michael kind of came up with the term characterization test for what it's worth. A lot of people credit him with that. Um, the idea here, though, is there is a way that you can actually add tests to an existing system that give you the confidence that the test is testing the thing that it's supposed to and that the production code is doing the thing the test says. And that that's kind of like a reverse test-driven development process. Because when you're test driving things, you want red green refactor right you want you want to build a test that fails then you want to see the test pass by writing the production code that makes it work and then you want to refactor that code into something better and and make it cohesive within the system right that's one of the parts of refactoring is once you've added a new feature to a system it may not be entirely cohesive there may be non duplication or there may be other things going on there and you want to resolve all that thing so that's where the refactor part comes in um, what we want to do when we're writing characterization tests, it's still very important to see a test fail, right? Until you see a test fail and go red, there is no reason that you should have that it actually tests the thing that you that you think that it should, right? That's that's key for either test driven development or by writing characterization tests or anything like that. If you've never seen a test fail, you should not trust it. Um, that it, it's just very important. <laughs> Uh, are there any questions so far? Because I'm about to start driving into the process of writing characterization tests, and I want to make sure that everybody's on the same page for where we're going. I'm going to take that to mean either there's no questions or everybody's eating their food right now. <laughs> okay, cool. So I actually don't follow this process for characterization tests, but I probably will now after having read it. Um, there are five steps in writing a characterization test. So 
you want to use a piece of code in a test harness. And that's that's fairly easy. So what that means is bas basically we just need a test that calls this. Um, that that's the that's the big part. So let me I'm going to move the characterization stuff off screen so that I can refer to it, but we don't need to see it together. Can everybody see my screen OK? Can, do I need to do a font bump or anything like that? No? OK. Um, I'm going to open up side by side the test and the code. And I like to think about it when I'm test driving, especially. I like to think about the spec first and then the production code second. So I go left or right. So I usually do the test on the left and the code on the right. So I'm going to open up the spec file. Of course, I put it in the wrong side. All right, so here's the test that I have that's supposed to execute the production code. So this is step one, right? I need something that expects that fizzbuzz method to do something. Well, I actually have something. I do expect for calling that fizzbuzz method to equal true, which is nonsensical because it doesn't even take into account the fact that it takes in a number. So if you look, I've actually got the, the tests kind of running live here in the bottom pane. So if I if I just change this true to false, it doesn't really matter what I do here. You'll see that guard kind of picks it up and says, hey, you know, you expected and this does something useful test for the, the result of calling fizzbuzz to equal false. But I got an argument error here. You passed me zero, but I expected one argument for number. So you can kind of see like the, the workflow is beginning. I'm calling that production code, but I'm not calling it correctly. So let's try calling it correctly. So I'm going to pass in one. That's step one, is calling the code. Step two is writing an assertion that you know will fail. Technically, I know this assertion is going to fail because it's already failed, right? We expected for it to return false, but I got something else. Actually, I got something else that doesn't even make sense. We're putting stuff. And in fact, what I probably want to do here is return the string just so that we can test against the, uh, the result. So let's do that. OK, so I've changed the production code down at the bottom here. Now you can kind of see that it did something. Um, but we've already got a problem. I'm already changing production code that I don't understand fully because it clearly didn't do the thing that I thought it was going to do. I'm going to put it back. I don't know how to test the output to standard output, by the way. So we might have to make some more changes to the production code before we can actually get it under test, which is our chicken and egg problem. Um, so that's step two, is write an assertion that you know will fail. And then step three is that we let that we let the outcome of the test determine what the test should have actually said. And that will probably seem backwards, especially if you're doing test-driven development, right? When you're test driving something with test-driven development, you're saying, this is how the system should behave, and don't go green until it does that. What you're doing with a characterization test is you're saying, Here's something absurd that should never be true. And then, it, of course, when the test comes back and says, hey, that was absurd, this is never going to be true, then you say, well, what was it? And in this case, what we got was a range of one to one. And so what we would write in this characterization test is that when you pass in one, we would expect to get a range of one to one back. And what we're saying is the way the production code works right now, it doesn't matter how we think that it should run because it's in production and it's doing something useful and people are relying on it. And so therefore, even if it's a bug, even if it's bad behavior that this test, that this function or method works by, we want to maintain that because somebody might be relying on that bug. That's essentially, and I don't want to get too, too much in the weeds and mud throwing, that's essentially how JavaScript works. There are structural bugs in JavaScript that people are relying on every day in production. And if the people who wrote and maintained JavaScript were to change that, it would break thousands of people's applications. Because even though the JavaScript behavior would be considered a bug by many people, it's part of like the known bugs. <laughs> so people are actually exploiting that bug and using it in their production code all the time. So that's the kind of the same thing here, right? If this code is running somewhere in production and it isn't doing the thing that it's supposed to do, we actually want it to continue doing the not thing that we want it to do until we fully understand that better. Um, in this case, it, it's a little bit confusing to me that I got that range back, but now I'm looking at it and I'm I'm seeing this for loop, and now I understand. Oh, I wrote I changed production code that I didn't actually understand, so I'm going to back that out and kind of go through this a little bit more systematically. Um, so that's step four: is change the test to actually be what you're getting from the production code, rather than what you think that it should be doing. 
And then you just keep repeating that until you have essentially all the edge cases covered. Um, the other reason, Zach, why this code came to mind as a really good example for characterization tests is there's a lot of branching logic, right? So when you're characterizing code, every time there's a decision point in the code where there's like an if and else or something like that, there are two paths that the code could potentially take. And so characterization tests, if they're going to completely describe the behavior of production code, need to kind of test through all those different branch conditions so that you understand what it is that it actually does. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've been in like 100 line long methods that have six or seven different branch points and getting getting full test coverage over a method that big is almost impossible, uh, especially after the fact, because if you write the test before the fact, you're unlikely to write a method that's 100 lines long. So I thought this would be a good little mini example for us to, to kind of go through today and talk through. Um, with all that in mind, are there any questions about what characterization tests are or how we're going to use them? I'm going to take a drink. <laughs> well, all right, all right. Let's get to it then. So we've got we've got a test, and we want we want a, like a good base test for how this thing is going to behave. Um, I'm inclined to not go out and re real like go. I'm, I'm inclined not to go out to the internet and search for how to test the output to standard output of a test, and rather change the production code and introduce it's a seam for testing. Um, so that's kind of my first thought is rather than doing these puts, which prints out to standard output and then prints a new line at the end of it, to rather build up an array of, um, basically build up the string with the same kind of output that we would have otherwise gotten if we had printed it out to standard output. Um, so that's kind of my thought right now. Anybody else have any different ideas? All right, let me try that then. I'm going to uh, create a string here at the top of this, and I'll just make it an empty string. So we'll call this the result and make it an empty string. And then anywhere we have a puts, I'm going to do result plus equals fizzbuzz and then just throw the new line in there like that. How safe is the change that I'm making right now in terms of am I changing the behavior of this application? Because I am changing the behavior of the application. There's no, there's no getting around it. One prints to standard output, the other one does not. But in terms of the functionality, what do you think about what do you think about this? Is that question directed towards me? <laughs> Any, anybody. <laughs> yeah, this, uh, so Zach, this is no longer your code. This is our collective yeah, code. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> we have made it the groups. <laughs> and now we all own the outcome from it. <clears throat> OK, so we've got result. It looks like 2s is unnecessary there. And then at the end of this, we want to return result. I will go ahead and just um, still puts the result so that it still does at least what we think that it was doing before. What do you think? Is this is this a relatively safe change? I think the answer is no. I think if I were really trying to rigorously do this and I actually had production code that relied on what I was doing here, I would not consider what I just did very safe. A safer change or a safer, yeah, a safer change would be not touching the code and just testing the system out, of course. Yeah, yeah. Um, let me just look really quick and see what that looks like. RSpec test standard out. I know there's a way to do it. RSpec added a new output matcher. Expect it to output. OK, well, let's try that then. Um, I'm going to undo all these things, and we're going to see if we can test this thing without having to introduce that somewhat risky and dangerous seam. All right, so here I am back, and now we're, we're testing the result of it instead. Um, so what I believe I can do here is say, expect that to output, and then we need to put something crazy in here. So what's something crazy? The word crazy. All right, crazy it is. <laughs> okay, so 
expected block to output crazy, but it was not a block. Okay, so I have to make this a block. This is one of the weird things about our spec. Sometimes when you're testing something and then you need to test that some other thing over here happened, like I executed this code and then I looked at the standard output and it was over here. Sometimes you can't do that inside of parentheses. You have to do that in a block form like this. So we're saying expect when I execute the code fizzbuzz fizzbuzz1 to when I when I execute that, then it should output to standard out for this other thing. OK, so you must change chain to standard out or to standard hour to standard error off of the output matcher. So it looks like it's telling me that I need to stdout. Does that look right? Let's try that. OK, look at that. So now we're saying we expected this block that we ran to output crazy, but instead it output one and then a new line. So that was a good, that was a really good suggestion, Zach. Um, this change is much, much less risky because we didn't actually change the behavior of the application any. We're just testing it and characterizing it. So I like that. So what we're learning now then is that when we pass the number one to fizzbuzz, what we get is one and then a new line. So we're going to take that verbatim and say, you know what, we get a new line. And I'm going to put this inside of a context. And I'm going to say context with one as the argument. And I'm actually just going to take the expectation of does something useful off. OK, so fizzbuzz with one as the argument, it's expected to output one to standard out. There we go. So now we have our first characterization test. That's pretty exciting. What, uh, you know, apart from adding like a code coverage tool, which we could probably do right now if we wanted to, what would be a way for us to determine how much of this method that we've actually characterized? I mean, the trivial answer is to use that input to the you know, to the source and see which branch you've you've hit. Like, look at the output, and we know our input is one, and we put that thing. We didn't put any of the other things. I think it's so actually we can really assume hard. We did, yeah. Let's uh, let's add coverage. What does code coverage? What's I always forget the gem name. Is it, the the simple cov is the thing now. Yeah, let's try that one. Let's add let's add a code coverage tool in if we can and see where we go for that. So simple cove. And I probably should go and look up what simple cove how to how to put that into a project. So I'll bring that back over here. All right. So getting started. We don't need to worry about requiring and not requiring, although require false, I guess, is what we want there, right? Because we want to require it ourselves. So I'll do require false. That'll make sure that the gem doesn't load immediately because we want some. We want it to. We want it to load where we want it to load. So we need to put this into our spec helper right here. So let's go do that. Right up at the very top here. Okay, that'll start our coverage tool as soon as we can. So you, you want it at the very top because the load path and the require it's instrumenting things and so you want it to be there before other things get loaded in your in your application and then let's see when you run your test suite then you should end up with a thing called coverage dot coverage slash index html all right let's see if that was enough to do it i always forget if there's another step here or not so i need to run bundle install to pull in simple cove and then run guard again and if I did that right, then I should be able to make a change to this file, and it should run the spec. And then I should have a file here. Um, I don't know the easiest way to find this. I might just do open. Here we go. And then go to my WSL folder, because I'm running in WSL. And go into my home folder. Yeah, and then inside of here, my source folder, and then go into fizzbuzz. 
I should have a coverage. And then here's my index.html file. All right, cool. So I should be able to click on my production code. And there we go. Now I can see which of the branch paths that I have taken when I'm, when I'm executing this. So what it looks like to me is that we hit all the branch conditions, but we didn't go inside them, right? So it tells me that this evaluated to false, this evaluated to false, this, and then this didn't evaluate to false. It didn't actually evaluate at all because we got here and there's no test. So I just said, put the number out. All right, so that's interesting. Now we have something to go off of when we're writing the rest of these characterization tests. So we have some things here that we can look at. If I want to take the first branch condition, I see if i modulus 3 is 0 or i modulus 5 is 0, then I want to see, and, and if basically if it's a, if it's a, um, if 3 or 5 is a, what's the word I'm looking for mathematically? Factor? No. Modulus. Yeah, but no, no, what's the, um, oh my God. Oh, remainder. What'd you say? The, the remainder is 0. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, so basically, if both of these are true, then we want to print fizzbuzz. Um, maybe we should work back to this one, because this looks like the end game. This looks like the big number right here. So let's go down to like 18 and see if we can make 18 happen. So if we're saying any character contains 5 in it, or if it's divisible by 5, so let's try to figure out how we can make this work. The, the latter case, it seems like it's easier to do. So if i modulus 5 is 0, then we want to we see buzz in the output. But we don't know that we want to see buzz in the output. We just know that 5 matters. It's like a special number to this thing. So let's try that. Let's add a test that says with 5 is the argument. And we're going to say, you know what we should expect it to see is um, gray header. That's an inside joke. All right, so what we see is we expected the block to output gray header, but instead it output one. Nope, that's because I didn't change the test for it, really. Let's try that. OK, so what we expected was to see gray header, but instead what we saw is one with a new line, two with a new line, fizz with a new line, four with a new line, and then buzz with a new line. That's a lot. That is, there's a lot going on there. I don't really fully understand. Like, if I'm just reading that code, I'm not thinking about all the iterations that have happened, all the for loops. So it would be really hard for me, as not a computer, <laughs> to go through and try to write this characterization test and actually have any idea what would happen, except for just asking the computer what running that code actually does. So I'm just going to grab that, because that's exactly what we're supposed to do. And I'll take this and replace it with that. OK, cool. So now we have two tests to pass. All right, let's look at our coverage report and see where we got now. Hey, look at that. We were trying to test line 18, but we also got 16 sort of accidentally, right? And the reason is, now if we start thinking about this, and part of the characterization test is, is to help you as a developer think about what's the code doing while we're running it in these tests, you can see now, OK, well, there's this 4i and 1 up to the number that we passed in. And if we passed in 5, then we're going to go, OK, 1, 2, 3, and this is going to match. And then we're going to go 4, 5. So we have two, two paths tested by that one test, which is cool. All right. So let's get this uh, let's get this end game one right here. Um, and in order to get this, we kind of have to actually think like the computer, right? Because we have to figure out what is a number whose modulus when it's divided by 3 is 0, and also whose modulus when it's divided by 5 is 0. The easiest thing to do in this case is just multiply those two numbers together, right, and get 15. So let's try to see what happens if we give 15 to the test as the argument. Oh, it's already 1 o'clock? Oh my goodness. I'm sorry. We should have started earlier. <laughs> All right, so I clearly have passed in 5 still. I'm going to pass in 15, and I'm going to go with, um, oh man, uh, non-fungible non tokens, because that's a good thing for cryptocurrency these days. All right. So I expected it to say NFT, but instead I got this big long set of output right here. Um, 
I'm again, I'm going to just assume that this code is doing exactly the thing that it's supposed to do. And so I'm going to replace what's inside of here with that. And now you can kind of see we've got we've got characterization tests. Well, I did that wrong. Hang on. Missed the leading. Yep. Are you saying I was misleading? <laughs> OK, so now you can see that we have characterization tests. And if we go and look at our coverage report, we're not testing every possible branch condition, right? Because we have we have this part and we have this part. So we don't know which of those two things we actually hit when we hit it. But we do have 100% coverage, meaning every line of this method was executed. So we're not quite to the point where if we were really trying to get 100% understanding of this thing with characterization tests, we would be there. Um, but one thing about characterization tests, and maybe we'll have to pick this up next time, is, is talking through the refactoring part. But one of the things about characterization tests is they don't actually have to, and they shouldn't just be limited to expected inputs to the function. Um, that's one thing that's really important is that a lot of times, if this code's been running there for a long time, especially if it's code that's like in a library that somebody else might be using that you don't have access to, you don't know if people are exploiting some kind of behavior of the code that you didn't anticipate anybody exploiting. Like when you pass in a non-number value or something like that, they might be looking for that output and doing something based off of that, right? Like they might be relying on your code to do the parsing to tell them that wasn't a number and then using whatever the nil is or whatever that comes out of that function or, or method to tell them what to do next. So if you change that behavior, even in a really nuanced way, you might be messing with somebody else's code. So another couple of things that we might consider doing here would be putting our QA hats on. What happens if you pass nil? Um, I think what we wanted to do is return the answer to life, the universe, and everything, right? So what we said is we expected when the block was passed with nil to output 42, but it output nothing. That's interesting. I don't know how to say nothing. Is it like nothing? Nope. Oh, I guess what it's saying is it's an empty string. So I guess what we're saying is that when we expect it to do nothing, we need to just give it an empty string. There we go. OK, so when you pass in nil, you get string out. All right, give me something else to test here. I have one really good one that I want to test, but I don't want to I don't want to lead anybody to it first. A block? Pass a block into it? <laughs> uh, OK. I guess that would look something like this, right? So I'm calling fizzbuzz, and I want to say puts here. No, I don't want to put. I want. I can't put. I, I guess maybe just like that. I don't know what to do there. Sure. What's the worst that could happen? I don't know. <laughs> Let's try that. Wrong number of arguments, given zero, expected one. So in this case, when we pass in a block instead of passing in an argument, what we are really expecting for it to do is not to do anything with standard output. We're expecting it to raise an error. And in this case, it's a very specific error, right? So we're going to get a warning that says, hey, if you just use raise error like that, it could be anything. So you should be really specific about what you're expecting it to raise. And in this case, what, what we actually saw when we ran it was an argument error. So let's do that. Let's say, when you do this, expect it to raise an argument error, because that was the behavior that it had before. All right, so there we go. So we've expected our code now to raise an argument error if you try to pass a block in without passing in a number. Um, the one I wanted to try was, what happens if you use a negative number? So let's try with a negative, with, with negative 4 as the argument. What hap What do you think is going to happen with this? I haven't. I haven't pre-baked this answer. I don't know what it's actually going to do. Any uh, Any predictions? Anybody want to call the shot? It should do from the range from one to negative four, right? Yeah. All right. So we're going to say it should uh, should output bananas, but instead, oh nope. I need this. I need to put the two. Standard out. There we go. 
Okay, so we expected it to output bananas to standard out, but instead it output nothing. That's interesting. So what happens when you go from I and one to like negative four? I think I can do code just inside here. So that gives me a range. Let's try for i in 1 to negative 4. What did I do wrong there? Oh, I guess I don't need to take yeah. that. You don't part. need the block parameter. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, what if you put a semicolon after the I? Do you need that explicitly? I don't think so. No, to, okay. But what's weird is it's not actually doing like a. Uh, it's not doing the putzing. Right. What if it's four? Oh, look at that. So the result of the four is the is the range, right? So in the case of one to negative four as a range, it returns that range. But when you do one, two, four, it goes forward and iterates for each one of those things. So it seems like, based on what I'm seeing, Ruby doesn't know how to use a range in negative direction like that. Mm -hmm. like, I think yeah. you could do I think negative four to one. Four to one. Well, I think you can do four maybe to one. No. You can't nope. range downward is what I'm seeing, but you can go forward. That's yeah. really interesting. So what we're learning here, I guess, is that when you call it with a negative number, it's going to, it's going to output nothing because it's not actually going to run. So that may, that may be the desired behavior and it may be a bug. We don't really know. And in, in this case, we don't really care. We just want to see what happens when we run it. So now we know that if we pass negative four in, it's not going to actually execute those loops, and we'll just get we'll get nothing back. That's really interesting. I didn't I didn't anticipate that one. Me yeah. either. All right, I think we're we're kind of out of time for this one. Um, I would I would really like to now that we have these characterizations in place, I'd love to spend a little bit of time in like a mob pairing session and just think about different ways now that if we wanted to that we could change this code in a safe way now that we know how it's how it should behave based off of that we could we could make some changes to this that would be safe so that when we come back to it later we still have those tests and they're still telling us what we want for what it's worth characterization tests are not necessarily tests that you keep um, you don't always want that behavior to be maintained forever characterization tests are both a tool for you as a developer to know how something works but they're also a tool for you to be able to refactor code um, initially so you can get code that's maybe in a huge method that has hundreds of lines in it and you want to break that up into multiple methods you can use characterization tests to test the heck out of that thing and just get all the inputs and outputs documented and then you can refactor that's your seam to refactor and add multiple methods extract things out to multiple methods once you do that then you get to decide how that method is supposed to work and if you own that entire code base, you can change how the characterization of those tests really is. You can change the behavior so that if you really do want to support negative four, this test no longer makes sense. It made sense when you didn't know how the code was supposed to behave. But now that you know how it does behave, you can say, oh, well, I do want to pass in negative four sometimes. And then you can test drive that, right? You can change the test to say, when I pass negative four, this is the thing that I'm looking for. And it's no longer a characterization test. It's a specification. It's a thing that you want the system to maintain going forward. So these characterization tests are really cool because what they give you is a test harness, a safety harness to fall into when you're making changes that you don't fully understand. And that's kind of the thing that came to mind, Zach. I know you didn't intend that when you were when you were presenting last month, but you triggered all these other uh, all these other thoughts in my brain that that uh, kind of led to this conversation today. So I appreciate you sharing with us last month and. Uh, I think that would be fun, unless there's something else on the agenda for next month, it would be fun to kind of continue this and, and do some mob stuff on it. What do you think? Thumbs up. I think that's a good idea. Katerina, how did this land? I know this is this is a little bit advanced and a little bit not advanced. It's kind of like in the middle, but it's also a technique that I think 
Bill, t tell me if you think I'm off base here. I'd say probably 90% of developers never, never see, never touch. Right. But I, I think uh, on our current project, Katarina and I do quite a bit of this a little bit. Um, you know, uh, finding untested things and putting tests around them to kind of characterize them exactly as their name. So, yeah. And really, you know, setting up context, that's something Katarina should be um, pretty familiar with is uh, a setting up context to, to say explicitly, we're in this state when this spec runs. Um, so that should be familiar. Yeah, that's great. All right, what I'm gonna do then, I'm gonna, Bill, I might lean on you a little bit to put this up on a repo. And we can kind of play around with this a little bit more um, for next month. Yep. And uh, maybe play around more with the VS Code live share stuff as well. But we've got Guard in here now. So you, when you're making tests, it'll just flow and, and show you all the tests as they're running. We've got code coverage so we can kind of see when we're making a change, whether or not we're covered. One of the interesting things now that comes out of this is these comments are now less valuable, right? If you're coming in here the first time, they might be really valuable, but actually, if you're look, if you're reading this, you're saying if the number is divisible by three or contains three, print fizz. You might think that if the number is three, then you should only see fizz. But what we're actually seeing is the behavior of this thing is that when you pass in something like five, you don't just see buzz. You see all the numbers in between. And so these comments are now actually less valuable than the test because the tests are actually asserting against the running code. And the comments are essentially what somebody wrote for, for Zach to implement, like they, they were the rules that somebody made up for FizzBuzz, but without really thinking, you know, without without understanding that, without having access to that FizzBuzz, you know, specification, all we have to go by is the comments, and the comments actually don't describe it as well as the specs do at this point. So it's kind of nice because when you get to a certain point like this, you can just delete, you can just kind of delete the uh, the uh, the comments out because you get the tests that tell you in very clear language what happens when you pass different arguments. And, all right, all right. Oh, um, I'm sorry, Zach, I didn't see your messages in the chat. Um, yeah, I, I want to, so I want to do some of that stuff that you're, you're, you're recommending there next month. I want to try playing around and, and breaking things and like, you know, seeing if there's other ways to, to use the Ruby API to, to change the code and make it either more readable or more performant. There's all kinds of reasons that you might change code um, just to make sure that we understand it first is kind of the goal. Okay. Cool. Um, thank you. I'll see you guys next uh, month, I guess. All right. All right. Thanks for joining. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.